In the 1960s and 70s, the Gambino crime family was arguably the most powerful underworld organization in New York City. Its power structure seemed carved in stone, and membership was all but impossible for a young entrepreneur with aspirations of the mob life. But for one man, exclusion from this family was not going to be an option, and he knew of only two ways to achieve his aspirations. One was to earn, and the other was to murder. He accomplished the first by streamlining the auto theft industry, and the other by streamlining human atrocity. This is the legend of Roy DeMeo. I wouldn't know a gunman if I saw one. Gangster era stuff. Time feuds of public enemies bring a reign of terror and baffle police. How did this famous gangster treat you? He treated me wonderful. This is what I'm telling you, what I'm exposing. This is my doom, 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 doom. I get a text from Bill Cotolo Jr., <laughs> right? If you you should know who he is if you're listening to this show. But uh, if you hadn't, he's the son of Wild Bill. They were in the Colombo family during the Colombo family wars. And uh, well, this is a great story. Yeah, it's yeah. a great story. And uh, I'm not going to tell the whole thing tonight. But uh, basically, he was in some rough stuff with the Colombos, and they end up killing his dad. And what was amounting to a, a just a dick move, really, and uh, a heartbreaking story. Didn't have it coming. And uh, his dad was a was a ruthless guy and a tough gangster, and he was the real deal. What happened to him was wrong. But anyway, that's not the story. I got a, a text from him, and he's telling me a story. And I said, hey, man, do you mind if I read it? He's like, nah, go ahead. So uh, I'm going to read the story just as he uh, sent it to me. So here it is. Hey, my brother, when we were kids, we would ride around on our bikes looking for other kids' bikes to rob. But one day in 81 to 83, we stopped our bikes in front of the Gemini. It was f***ing hot. We didn't have hydro flasks back then. My friends and I were afraid to go in. Roy was outside at times, so I went in and asked the bartender for a glass of water. He looked at me with a smirk as if to say, I can't believe this kid just walked in here. To be straight up honest, I had no idea that it was he, that the stories that were floating around were about him. Then two guys walked in I thought were brothers, and they looked familiar to me. I knew I'd seen them talking to my father by the house. It was Joey Testa. They recognized me because my father introduced them to me. I was 11 to 12. What the fuck did I know? So as Joey puts his hands on my shoulders, and he says to Roy, You know who this kid is? Roy looks at me with a scowl that he always wore. This is Wild Bill's son. All of a sudden, Roy's face lit up with a smile. First, I was like, who the fuck is Wild Bill? It was the first time I'd heard somebody refer to my dad as Wild Bill. Roy then comes over, puts his hands on my shoulders and says, you tell your dad that Roy by the gem sends his love. Please don't forget. When I got back home for dinner, I tell my dad. He literally looked at me and said, Willie, what the fuck were you doing over there? I said, I was thirsty. He then smirked and just said, well, Willie, it's a bar where men hang out. It's not for kids. You stay outside the joint. If you see Roy again, and yes, he and Joey are good friends of mine, you can say that you told me and just say, my dad sends his love. After that, I stopped in for water every weekend. Bike riding, not scheming. Have a beautiful weekend, brother, Bill. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Bill, for that. That was awesome. Just to get that was uh, more than cool. So anyway, there's that. Welcome back to another episode of Partners in Crime. I am still Bill Crooks, just a normal guy, no one to worry about. To my right, he's one of the most dangerous narrators in the business. He is Zach the Zip Griffith. What? Well, yeah, one of them. And across the table, speaking of dangerous, Joshua the Intern. All right, let's get started. Roy Albert DeMeo is born on September 7th, 1940 to a hardworking Italian immigrant family in the Bath Beach neighborhood of Brooklyn. The DeMeos hail from the Naples region. Although his immediate family is described as poor, Roy's uncles hold successful positions, one as a prosecuting attorney and another as a forensic scientist. His mother reportedly hopes he'll become a doctor, but time would reveal him to be more of a butcher than a surgeon. Unlike most mobsters of his day, Roy takes the time to complete school, doing so from James Madison High School in 1969. During his high school years, he first seeks employment as a delivery boy, and then as a butcher's apprentice. 
Realizing that these honest pursuits afford little in the way of serious money, DeMeo starts a small loan sharking business. He loans money to various young hoodlums in his neighborhood, and doles out merciless beatings to anyone that comes up short on interest payments. By the end of the 1960s, his loan sharking business has grown in scope and sophistication. As his criminal enterprises thrive, Roy DeMeo begins to have a larger vision of what his future should hold. Specifically, DeMeo aspires to become a made member of an Italian crime family. As luck would have it, he eventually catches the eye of one Anthony Nino Gaggi, a captain in the Gambino crime family. So DeMeo kind of reminds me of Goodfellas in the beginning when Henry Hill goes, All my life I wanted to be a gangster. This is his whole goal in life. You know, he's not the accidental gangster of uh, Ori Spado's nature. But uh, the whole nature of loan sharking, I think, gets misunderstood. It's not like somebody's, uh, they can't pay their electric bill, right? So you help them out with a couple of hundred bucks and now they're on the hook. You know, it doesn't work like that. What it'll be is some guy has a big idea. He, he gets a line on a bunch of cocaine, something like that. But he needs like five grand to put up for the cocaine. On the street, it's got a value of like 20 grand. It all he's got to do is borrow the money and then not do the coke, right? It, it can work out, but the problem is you're going to pay a huge amount of interest, usually 25 to 26 percent interest. So you owe 25 percent, so it's taking a big chunk of your change right there. You've got to make your interest payments. It's called a VIG, right? So you got to make your VIG right off the bat. You're paying the interest, paying the interest, paying the interest. You miss one, they double it right off the bat. So now you're paying 50% interest on the money you borrowed and you're feeling the freaking heat. So these guys aren't necessarily, they, they had these pie in the sky dreams of making a bunch of money, but in the end, they're lucky to get the hell out of there, right? I think you miss three vigs, you get a physical warning, right? And after that, you're, you're killed. So it's, it's a rough business and uh, lots of shit happened. Did you ever see, not the Irishman? but kill the Irishman? I saw a little bit of it. I never finished it, though. Lester. So, Lester yeah. Diamond. So, the, yeah. So this guy, this guy borrows money from the Bananos, right? He wants to borrow from a Jewish entrepreneur kind of guy. He goes, oh, I never loaned my own money, but uh, I can get you the loan from the Bonanno family, right? And he's going to open a restaurant. That's his whole goal, right? So he borrows, I forget how much, say it's 50 grand or 200 grand, whatever it is. He borrows it from the Bananos, right? There's this black guy that's a courier, and he's going to bring it to him. But that guy gets all high, and maybe he pilfers a little bit of the money, and he, and he gets high on it. And then some shit goes wrong, and he gets arrested, and they catch him with all this money, and the cops seize the money and throw him in jail. He's like, hey, I got some bad news, you know, the, the money was on its way, but the guy got stoned, and ah, the money was seized. And the guy's like, well, it's not my freaking problem. I never got the money. Get out of here. Goes, I don't understand. <laughs> you you got to pay that money. He goes, I'm not paying the money. I never got it. He has this incredulous look on his face like, what the hell you mean? <laughs> of yeah. And so like the rest of the time, he's trying to blow up this guy and stuff. But yeah, but he's not, you know, hey, I know it's a bad deal. He's like, I, I don't understand why you think you don't owe this money. And, but this is the kind of shit that happens. You know what I mean? You have this great plan and shit goes wrong. Your stash gets robbed. You get robbed, you know, but one little thing happens, man. And you're in a bad, bad shape with these guys. And it's really how loan sharking goes. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's other kinds of things like, uh, you know, the, the mob on the garment district. So a designer wants to come out with a line of clothes. This was actually an example they gave in one of the things I saw. He wants to do this whole big show designer thing, and a, a bank's not going to loan him money based on his vision and stuff. The mob will. And the mob's tied into the unions and all the other stuff. So they give him the money to run it at a huge interest and stuff. This guy's in the same boat now. It better take off and take off quick and stuff. So uh, really, I'd think twice before you go this route for loaning money. And if a bank doesn't want to loan you the money, there's a reason. So DeMeo's uh, basically running these various racketeering schemes, hoping to get noticed. And he actually gets a phone call at his house from the house of Gaji. He's like, hey, I want to meet with you. And it's like an exciting time for him where most people would be like, oh, shit. You know, he's like, it's the moment I've been waiting for. So he must have been running a serious scheme to get the attention of these guys and get a personal phone call an invitation to come over gaji tells the mayo that even more money can be made by working directly for the gambino family he officially decrees that roy de mayo will act as an associate placing him on the first rung of a long ladder to being a made man 
DeMeo and Gaji proved to be a good team, working together to expand their various rackets to a mutual advantage. While their business interests are very much aligned, their personas are very different. Anthony Gaji is the classic gentleman gangster and works very closely with Paul Castellano, the heir apparent to Carlo Gambino. Roy DeMeo, by contrast, is more of a street thug who's getting things done in the trenches. DeMeo is becoming what is known as an earner, and everybody loves an earner. DeMeo proves himself to be more than just a loan shark, expanding his talents to include theft and other entrepreneurial pursuits. At this time, hardcore pornography is illegal, and although most Italian crime families, including the Gambinos, look down upon such activities, Roy sees it as an opportunity to make a ton of money. Roy is right. He makes so much money, in fact, that his boss Gaggi, and presumably Gambino, are willing to look the other way as long as the steady stream of cash flows in. So Roy also becomes a silent partner in a peep show and a prostitution establishment in New Jersey after the owner of his business becomes unable to pay his loan sharking debts. So uh, Roy's beginning to deal in pornography. When they say that Roy's getting involved in hardcore pornography, I don't know what you're thinking, but we're talking about, like, not just humans. Stuff that you don't want to get caught with. Yeah, this is what he's doing. It's, it's some really nasty, dirty stuff that Roy's doing. Yeah, it's not some gentle, uh, soft porn that the Gambinos are opposed to. It's stuff that makes the Gambinos go, what the hell? <laughs> This is what they're dealing in. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page of what we're talking about here. 1972 also sees DeMeo's financial skills manifest into a lucrative position in an above-board organization called the Brooklyn Credit Union. The opportunity is created by Gaji as a means of reorganizing the banking institution and exert their mob influence over its financial dealings. DeMeo proves to be quite up to the challenge and soon introduces his credit union colleagues to another extremely lucrative side business laundering money for his associates, and supplying high-interest loans to corrupt clients with stolen credit union funds. He'd often loan money to drug dealers looking to make a big score. If the dealer couldn't make the interest payments, they'd be given a physical warning and eventually killed. So at this time, it's not unusual for organized crime to get their tentacles into financial institutions, and uh, somehow they've already got their meat hooks in this thing, and Gaji puts... DeMeo on the board of this. At some point, he starts looking beyond. It was just supposed to launder money, but he reorganizes the thing and gets it going. He's like, hey, you know what? We could loan money to not good people. You know, like, we'll just loan money to drug dealers and things like that under the table, too, and they'll pay us back. They're good for it because if they don't, we'll kill them. Right? And it's basic mob stuff. Yeah, but somehow he also corrupts everybody that's on the board. Like, hey, I'm stealing. You should be stealing, too. And pretty soon everybody is embezzling from this company. Gaji's making money. He's making money. And uh, as much as everybody's taken from it, the thing's going to go belly up. But before it does, he's going to make around $2 million in today's economy. DeMeo's loan sharking clientele primarily consists of those in the automobile industry. Eventually, he expands his clients to include a dentist's office, an abortion clinic, flea markets, and restaurants. He finds himself frequently telling his neighbors and acquaintances that he works in the construction business, along with food retailing and used cars. The stream of money is flowing strong, and DeMeo realizes that he needs to protect his interests with a crew of his own. He forms a group of ruthless criminals that become known as the infamous DeMeo Crew. Chris Rosenberg, a.k.a. Chris Harvey, becomes the first member of the DeMeo crew. Rosenberg, now 24 years old, first meets DeMeo at just 16. DeMeo and Rosenberg cross paths during a run-of-the-mill marijuana deal at a Canarsie gas station in 1966. The two strike up a business arrangement with DeMeo loaning Rosenberg much more money than he's accustomed to, allowing Rosenberg to deal in larger amounts. Chris reportedly idolizes DeMeo, and shares his dream of becoming a made man. He's known for his vicious temper, his love of stealing fast cars, and dealing drugs. When 1972 rolls around, Rosenberg has acquainted his friends with DeMeo, and they begin working for him as well. They recruit Freddie DeNome, a Brooklyn-based drag car racer and accomplished car thief. It is said that he is more than capable of escaping law enforcement in a high-speed pursuit. DeMeo crew members also include DeMeo's cousin Joseph Dracula Guglielmo, Anthony Center, and Joseph and Patrick Testa. They also recruit an extremely talented car thief named Andre Katz. 
Katz is also an auto repair shop owner who has partnered with DeMeo in these stolen car schemes. So car theft is huge in the 1970s, especially in New York. One estimate had the annual count of car thefts in New York City at 77,000 cars. So DeMeo sends his crews out every night literally to rake in as many cars as possible. And the problem with the cars they're stealing at this point is that there's serial numbers stamped in on the frames and the engines. It apparently is a big pain in the ass, but what's good is that they can rip the parts off. And the parts, separately, are almost worth more than the car. So they're going around, they've got all these body shops and stuff that don't ask a lot of questions, or they outright own them, right? And it's getting to the point where they can steal so many cars that, say, a guy wrecks his Porsche, he brings it in. You can order the color, make, model, and year of that Porsche, and they'll go get you one. And they've even got cops on the take, you know, so the cops can look up and tell you where that car is. Like, oh, yeah. That's smart. Yeah. The cops are always driving around. And the cops, cops yeah, the driving. cops are on it. So it's just gotten crazy. There'd be a warehouse that the cops would find, and it's literally just packed with car frames, just stacked up. Like, they don't even care. They just leave them for you. (laughs) But everything else is scrapped down. And they said that uh, a lot of these organizations were more lucrative than General Motors was that year in making the cars. He said he sent 20 guys out every night to go looking. It is nuts. Imagine if uh, Uber was around back then. You just call an Uber and steal it. Yeah, they'd probably just shoot the Uber guy and take it. Although they're looking for, like, Mercedes-Benz and BMW. They're not, like, stealing the uh, the not. Gremlin. Yeah, they're not stealing the Pinto. No. Yeah, it's, it's the expensive cars that they're stealing. The crew establishes their base of operations at a bar, of course, called the Gemini Lounge, a local bar on Flatlands Avenue in the Canarsie area of East Brooklyn. It's basically a low-key drinking establishment secretly owned by DeMeo, with an apartment behind it rented by Guglielmo. I forget what it was before that. It's a church now. I gotta tell you this, when I'm watching these uh, docs, a lot of times they do it from the cop point of view, you know, because they don't have a lot of gangsters that are doing this. Yeah. But uh, there's nothing more macho than a 1970s cop, so I'm gonna try to do this. He goes, now, the Gemini Lounge was a watering hole. It was a place where a guy could have a drink after work. Not a disco. <laughs> no, no, a quiet place. The distinction being it's owned by DeMeo, so people are getting killed there. It's like the bar uh, Nicholson owned in The Departed. Just killed guys in the back room. Oh, that's yeah. that's got to be, you know, like taken straight from this. Yeah, yeah. In 1973, Roy DeMeo has become one of the Gambino family's top earners. He's only 32 years old. This is the same year that DeMeo will discover yet another lucrative line of work business associate by the name of Paul Rothenberg finds himself in some legal trouble. Rothenberg is an illegal pornography distributor who has long been extorted by the Gambino family via the DeMeo crew. When Rothenberg's film processing studio is raided by law enforcement, they discover payments made to DeMeo. Roy and company become concerned that he can be leveraged to reveal their entire operation. Gaji orders the hit on Porno Paul and DeMeo is given the job. Roy summons Rothenberg to a meeting at a local restaurant. He reportedly tails his target to a nearby alley. Here, he stops Rothenberg and gives him two shots to the head with a 38 caliber pistol equipped with a silencer. So Rothenberg was left sprawled out in the alley and was eventually discovered by just a passerby. That film raid reportedly had over $500,000 seized, which is about $3 million today. So it's big business, you know. And by all reports, this is DeMeo's first kill, but it apparently woke some kind of demon within him because murder comes really easy to him from now on. Late 1974, a conflict of volcanic consequences brews between Roy DeMeo and Andre Katz. Katz has been picked up on a narcotics charge and is facing some time in prison if convicted. Law enforcement is far more interested in what the car thief can tell them about his criminal associates, namely Chris Harvey Rosenberg. Obviously, Rosenberg could potentially lead them to DeMeo. It's a chance he's unwilling to take. Upon being informed that Katz may be cooperating with authorities in their pursuit of DeMeo and his crew, Gaji again gives the order to take the trash out. In June of 1975, the unsuspecting Katz is lured to a confrontation. Katz views himself as a ladies' man. Maybe he is, I don't know. But... All they do is Rosenberg knows this girl. She seems like she just calls cats for her date. You know, like, hi, I'm a girl. You want to come over? He's like, yeah, I'll be right there. 
<laughs> well, yeah, there's actually a problem with that. I had a buddy a long time ago that got busted for cocaine dealing, and he was not a cocaine dealer. He was at like a Lee's Inn bar or something. This hot girl came up, starts dancing with him, asking him if he can find some coke. He would have found coke. <laughs> <laughs> he would have found Egyptian AK-47s if that's what it took to seal the deal. You know, he he broke his neck to make that deal happen for her and ends up getting two years. Be aware. So anyway, this is how it goes down, and uh, he drives across town like a sucker and uh, right into his death. Instead of finding a woman, Andre Katz finds the DeMeo crew waiting for him. Allegedly, the men throw a noose around the neck of the Randy Snitch, blindfold him, and throw him in the trunk of their car. Katz is then taken to a butcher shop called the Pantry Pride Meat Market in Queens. He's secured to a chair in the building, which is basically a slaughterhouse. Roy DeMeo's time spent as a butcher's apprentice is about to pay off. DeMeo stabs Katz repeatedly until he's dead. He then takes to dismembering his body with the meat processing tools and wrapping the individual parts into neat little paper packages. Separated pieces are then discarded into the fat collection dumpster outside the establishment. It's actually not a terrible plan. If the garbage truck collects the discarded fat dumpster, it'll take it to a special part of the landfill. And because of the nature of the rotting meat, the waste is covered almost immediately with a big layer of dirt. Right, So the pieces would be impossible to find, even with cadaver dogs. Apparently the dogs are trained to sniff dead protein, and the whole field is dead protein. So the problem in this scenario is that the trash pickup didn't come until after the weekend. So some homeless guy goes rooting around in the trash and discovers what he thinks is a fresh leg of lamb. Right, He figures he's got a good score until he notices the leg of a lamb has a tattoo. <laughs> So this, of course, uh, freaks him out, and he brings a ton of cops, and the forensic pathologist is a young girl who apparently the grisly sight of this sickens her almost to the point of fainting. I'm not big on leg of lamb, but I gotta think there's a world of difference between that and Katz's big-ass hairy leg. Maybe he wasn't a hairy guy. I don't know. He he strikes me as a hairy guy. I'm thinking everybody we talk about in this is a hairy guy. (laughs) Once Katz is identified, it's generally known that he has mob connections. This actually works to DeMeo's benefit. Police resources are always limited. When a criminal comes up dead, there is not a lot of interest in the way of public outcry. To add to the disinterest, there is little in the way of forensic evidence and zero witnesses. A few detectives, however, privately wonder if there aren't more people disposed of in this manner that have yet to be discovered. For the time being, the DeMeo crew has gotten away with a very public murder. Riding on the success of the Andre Katz elimination, the DeMeo crew refines what will become known as the Gemini Method. Their victims are lured into the back apartment rented by DeMeo crew member Joseph Dracula Guglielmo. The small flat has been modified into a makeshift slaughterhouse. The target is presumably made at ease, perhaps sitting at a small table in the kitchen. He's suddenly surprised by an abrupt shot to the head, and someone would quickly wrap a towel around the gaping wound to contain the mess. From there, other members would pierce the heart with a knife or ice pick to stop the flow of blood pumping immediately. Now the real work begins. A couple of guys clad only in their underwear drag the body to the bathroom and into the shower. The body is hung upside down from a presumably professionally installed shower rod, and its throat is cut to allow the body to be drained of its blood. Once the blood is completely drained or congealed, the corpse is wrapped in a swimming pool liner and moved to the living room. Here the body is dismembered, arms are cut at the elbow, not an easy job, legs at the knee, the head pops off quite easily, and only the torso remains. The disassembled parts are placed in individual boxes for easy transport, and then it's off to the Brooklyn Fountain Avenue dump. The dump, as luck would have it, is owned primarily by corrupt Italians so not a lot of questions will be asked. It's hard work, and the guys often take a pizza break halfway through, but in the end they have themselves a murder system ready for mass production. Mass production is exactly what Roy DeMeo has in mind. In the vein of Murder, Inc., the DeMeo crew got into the business of killing. Going far beyond the necessity of killing for his own business interests, he began to provide murder as a service to the other crime families of New York. If someone Since has an interorganizational problem with another family member, he could simply go to Roy. Problem solved. He's also reputed to specialize in the disposal of bodies, a 
case you have a pre-killed body you need help discarding. Well, he didn't kill everybody at the Gemini, but that was his preferred method. And he would just invite people over for a party or something. That part's a little confusing to me because it's like, is he such a great guy that everybody just comes over, you know? And, and they take him to the apartment in the go back. Go to Roy's place. Yeah, I'd be like, what the hell? No, I don't want to go to the Gemini. There's nothing <laughs> going on at the Gemini, you know? So, but anyway, like sometimes they'd have to get him like other places, like a parking lot. Or they said once on a, a yacht would take him out and stuff. And uh, But the Gemini was the perfect contained place, you know? And uh, a lot of the cops thought like the dismembering was unnecessary. And that he's just a psycho and stuff. But I kind of disagree because he's like, well, he could have just plugged him in the head and dumped him in the ocean. You know, I'm like, there's a lot of shit that could go wrong taking an entire body into a car, out to the water, onto the boat. And you're, when you're talking about the numbers these guys are doing, it seems like I don't know that they did it because they're all psychos. And plus at the dump, they know the guys running the place. They can just get in and get out easy. Yeah. Now, the one thing that doesn't uh, lend credence to that theory is that uh, Gaggi's nephew, who's that Dominic Montiglio, he said he visited there a lot. He was kind of like a pickup man, and he passed messages back and forth and stuff. He said that the guys seemed depressed if they didn't kill somebody at least once every three weeks. Like, the guys would get kind of down. <laughs> Got to boost morale. Right. But that doesn't mean they like chopping them up. You know what I mean? But they just like, I think they like killing people. But uh, who knows? A precarious subject for the DeMeo crew was the distribution of narcotics. The Gambino family, and most of the others at this time, were officially against drug dealing, wary of the law enforcement heat it tended to bring. It was further assumed that anyone caught dealing would be more likely to become an informant in order to escape the harsh penalties that were being levied on such crimes. Violating the drug dealing rule was technically punishable by death. Despite these dire consequences, Gaji and DeMeo were heavily into the drug trade. The enormous profits were too much to pass up. By the mid-70s, Roy is dealing cocaine out of the Gemini Lounge. He's also invested in a large Colombian marijuana operation that regularly imports 25-pound bales to be distributed from a Canarsie body shop. DeMeo kicks a tribute up to Gaji, of course, and Gaji pretends not to know where the extra cash is coming from. Around the end of 1975, Roy DeMeo has a brief dust-up with the IRS to largely do his connection to the failed credit union fiasco. As the defunct credit union eventually merges with another, the feds begin to question DeMeo's involvement and the source of his excessive wealth. DeMeo dances away from the charges, having quit the bank before its downfall. He also calls upon his friends and associates to provide false affidavits that name him as a legitimate employee with varying sources of income. It's enough to get them off his back. I could just hear him talking to the feds. He goes, you know, I left that place. I just had a bad feeling that uh, it wasn't being run right. Frankly, between you and me, I think some shady things might have been going on there. <laughs> things get a little complicated in mid-1976 when a main man in the Lucchese family named Joseph Brocini engages Roy in an argument. The conflict has something to do with their mutual interest in a pornography racket. Having the upper hand as an officially made man, Brocini takes the liberty of punching DeMeo square in the face, giving him a nice shiner for his troubles. As he's only an associate, Roy has little options at the moment, but later has a little sit down with his mentor Gaggi, and allegedly Gaggi's nephew Dominic Montiglio. Obviously, Roy DeMeo has plans for Brocini. Nino reminds him that the rules dictate that he not, under any circumstances, take action against a made man. The implication is clear. Don't get caught. On May 20th, 1976, Brocini is working in the office of a used car dealership he owns. He is apparently distracted as Roy DeMeo and Henry Borelli quickly and quietly enter the building. They subdue the employees at gunpoint, blindfolding and handcuffing them under the guise of a robbery. They then repay Brucelli's ill-considered punch in the face with five shots to the back of his head. Ransack the office for good measure and make their escape. Ransacking just for like. Uh, make they're it making look it like look robbery. like a robbery. Because he's a made guy, he can't take a, yeah. he can't take the heat for that. So it's like, hey, Dave, somebody came in and robbed the place. Pretty smart. All you need is plausible deniability when you're bringing in millions of dollars. Yeah. <laughs> at this point, it might behoove the DeMeo crew to lay low for a while, but it's not their style. 
following month saw the murder of Vincent Govanera. Govanera apparently had no crime ties whatsoever, but did have the misfortune of engaging in a physical altercation with Nino Gaji a couple years prior. Gaji was not one to forgive a transgression, and had always kept an eye out for Govanera. His nephew finally spotted him at a craps game in a New York neighborhood, alerted his uncle, and even left his own wife's birthday party to pursue poor Vincent. <laughs> Roy, Gaji, and Dominic waited by Govanera's car, and as he approached the three men unsuspecting, was shot several times and left him. He managed to survive about a week, but eventually succumbed to his wounds. It seems that Gaji's revenge list was not a short one. A man named George Byram made the cut, by feeding information to a burglary team that resulted in the sacking of Nino's own house. This act of insanity was answered by flying DeMeo to Florida. Once in the Sunshine State, he met with Gaji and Anthony Plotti, a Gambino soldier operating in Florida. Roy lured Byram to a hotel room under the pretense of a new business arrangement and immediately shot him to death as he walked into the room. The plan was to dismember him and carry him out in a few suitcases, but something apparently went wrong as he was later found in the hotel bathroom with his head cut halfway off. In the fall of 1976, the Gambino family goes through a massive change when its boss, Carlo Gambino, dies of natural causes. Paul Castellano is named the new boss. This is good news for Roy DeMeo. His mentor Nino is bumped up to the position of capo, taking over the crew of men Castellano ran. This promotion is beneficial for Roy, whose friend and boss is now even closer to the ruling Gambino hierarchy. It is further speculated that the death of Carlo and Gambino will eventually open up the family for new memberships. These speculations eventually lead to frustrations, as Paul Castellano is not excited about bringing Roy DeMeo into the Gambino hierarchy. Castellano considers himself to be more of a white-collar criminal, and the thuggish antics of the DeMeo crew, while beneficial, are not something he wants to associate with his organization in an official capacity. Gaji tries unsuccessfully to persuade his boss, and as 1977 ticks away, Roy DeMeo is still not gotten his button. Angry but undeterred, DeMeo commits to making even more money for the Gambino family until they have no choice but to acknowledge him. DeMeo finds his new cash source in a gang of Irish-American criminals known as the Westies, headed by a famed gangster named Mickey Spallani. So in the 1970s, the Irish mob was banging heads with the Italians, specifically the Genovese family, over a construction project called the Jacob K. Javits Convention Center. Now, the convention center is located in Spillane's Hell's Kitchen neighborhood. Spillane refuses to allow any involvement by Italians. He somehow manages to hold them off. Now, this has been going on for a while. It's a big embarrassment to the Italian families. So this is kind of setting up DeMeo to, to make a bridge here. Right? So the Italians are frustrated, they're embarrassed. They respond by hiring a rogue Irish-American hitman named Joseph Mad Dog Sullivan to assassinate three of Spillane's top lieutenants. The situation's tense to say the least when it comes to Roy DeMeo coming in. Obviously, Mickey Spillane is not going to greet DeMeo with open arms, so he needs to find another inn. His opportunity comes in the form of James Coonan, who has been in a long-standing war with Spillane since he was 18 years old. Coonan makes an agreement with DeMeo that if the Spillane problem is to disappear, he will take over the family and basically become an extension of the Gambino interest. So Coonan's got this long-standing beef with Spillane. Without getting too much into the Irish mob part of it, at one point at a very young age, uh, Coonan stands on a building and fires a Tommy gun down onto Spillane and these guys. And he doesn't really hurt anybody, but they realize that he's somebody they got to look out for. And uh, Spillane... Yeah. He retaliates by finding Coonan's dad and pistol whips him and kidnaps him and like tries to figure out where the son is and stuff. So there's this beef going on. So this is the end for DeMeo. If he can get rid of Spillane and put this guy in, and this guy's got a following going. So there's a civil war thing going on. And uh, this, is his, this is his big chance to get things taken care of. In May 1977, Roy and Edward Grillo murder Spillane as agreed making Jimmy the top criminal figure in the West Side. Roy, sensing an opportunity to create a vast source of income for his superiors, informs Anthony Gaggi of the possibilities of a partnership between the Westies and the Gambino family. Shortly afterwards, Coonan and his second-in-command Mickey Featherstone are called to a meeting with Paul Castellano, and they do, in fact, 
become a de facto arm of the Gambino crime family and agreed to share 10% of all profits. In exchange, the Westies will acquire several lucrative union deals and take on murder contracts for the Italians. And just to be clear, the Westies are into the exact same kind of shit that DeMeo's into. He's loan sharking, gambling, porn. Uh, maybe porn, prostitution. <laughs> but they, uh, they're doing that on the West side. So that's, it's, they become an extension of the Gambino family. It's impossible to ignore that Roy DeMeo plays a crucial role in securing the Westy Gambino alliance. This finally convinces Castellano to give Roy his button, or formally induct him into the Gambino crime family. DeMeo is made in mid-1977 and is put in charge of handling all family business with the Westies. He's also ordered to get permission before committing any murders and to avoid drug dealing. Despite this warning, DeMeo's crew continues to sell large amounts of cocaine, marijuana, and a variety of narcotic pills, an infraction committed by many mobsters at this time. The money is just too alluring. They continue to commit unsanctioned killings as well. In July 1977, Roy and his men indulged themselves in a double homicide, shooting to death Jonathan Quinn, a successful car thief suspected of cooperating with law enforcement, and Sherry Golden, Quinn's 19-year-old girlfriend. So the murder of these two take place in Brooklyn. Quinn's actually a friend of Nino Gaggi's. But when he becomes a rat, Roy DeMeo finds out. He tells Gaggi. So they call him for a sit-down at their hangout. And sadly, Quinn comes with his 19-year-old girlfriend. She stays in the car, and he's killed the second he enters the club. While the crew's in there cutting up the body parts, two jokers go up, and they're chatting up the girl. And then as soon as they're done and ready, eventually they shoot her, and they leave her body in the car. DeMeo and his men dump the bodies in locations where they'll be discovered to serve as a warning against any other aspiring rats. When questioned by Castellano as to the motive of killing a young woman, Gaji assures him that she was a risk and may have cooperated had the police pressured her. Castellano chooses to believe it, but things are beginning to go south for the DeMeo crew. Next problem that surfaces is a heavy debt that is mounting by crew member Edward Grillo. The substantial weight of the debt worried DeMeo and Gaggi as they felt it might make him susceptible to police coercion. Rather than simply forgiving the debt, they send him through the human meat machine like so many before him. It is the first time that the crew has processed one of their own. Now the proverbial shit hits the fan as problems arise with one of Roy's favorite crew members, Chris Rosenberg. Rosenberg travels to Florida to establish a large cocaine deal. He is to meet up with three Cuban frontmen who are middlemen for the Colombian cartel. Booking himself into a hotel under the assumed name of Chris DeMeo, he meets the Cubans and discusses business. Misunderstanding the politics of this undertaking, Rosenberg figures to sweeten his deal by eliminating the middlemen. He figures by killing the Cubans, he can deal directly with the Colombian cartel and save a little money. Under the pretense of traveling with the three men back to New York City, Rosenberg kills his contact, his son, and his brother-in-law. When he gets back to New York and shares his adventure with Roy DeMeo, his boss is in a complete state of shock and disbelief. So DeMeo can't believe this guy just messed with the Colombian cartel, and he's basically provoking a war between the Colombians and the Gambino family. So just trying to wrap his head around what kind of crap Chris has gotten him into, he's like, what, what name did you use? And he finds out that he used his name. So his disbelief turns into just sheer dread and panic. The Gambinos reach out to the Colombians to explain the misunderstanding, and it's decided that the only way to make things right is to kill Chris Rosenberg as a gesture of goodwill. Roy is given the job of cleaning up the mess that is his most loyal crew member. He reportedly stalls for weeks. I'm no Colombian drug lord, but I can count to three. <laughs> you kill three of my guys. Yeah. So how is killing Chris going to be enough? I'd want Chris and two of his family members. Yeah. And not the mother-in-law that he hates. It's got to be two people he likes. It's during this time that things go from very bad to much worse. On April 19, 1979, an innocent college student named Dominic Ragucci is working his job as a door-to-door -door vacuum salesman. He has the misfortune of being parked outside of DeMeo's house when the mobster is returning home. Roy sees the kid parked in front of his house and believes him to be a Colombian hitman. 
He immediately calls Freddy the Gnome and Joseph Guglielmo for backup, and the three mobsters throw the struggling college student into a high-speed chase for his life. Naturally, Speedster the Gnome is at the wheel, while the Mayo and Guglielmo are hanging outside the windows firing wildly at Raguchi, who is literally pleading for his life. The student's car becomes so damaged by bullets that it's rendered undrivable, and he's shot to death by the DeMeo assassins. Believing he has killed a Colombian assassin, Roy gathers his family and goes on the lam outside of New York for a short time. So eventually the whole thing hits the media cycle, and uh, Albert is Roy's son. He tells a lot of stories about this kind of time period and stuff, but he said uh, he was there when his dad saw on TV that it was an innocent college kid that she got shot, and uh, according to him, uh, Roy burst into tears and was just distraught when this happened. The accidental murder of the college student has Nino Gaji starting to regret his relationship with DeMeo, who is possibly starting to become more trouble than he's worth. DeMeo still hasn't killed Rosenberg. Gaji orders DeMeo to get the execution over with before there are any other accidents. In May 1979, Rosenberg, who seemingly has no knowledge of the Colombian agreement, arrives at a meeting of the DeMeo crew and is shot in the head by Roy. Somehow, he manages to get to his feet even as the blood gushes from his skull. Crew member Anthony Center finishes Rosenberg off as he senses that DeMeo is emotionally unequal to the task. Colombians have demanded that his murder make the papers as verification. Roy's men place Rosenberg's body in his car and park it on the side of Cross Bay Boulevard near Gateway National Wildlife Refuge to be found. So to make sure that it is a media spectacle, they apparently get a modified machine gun, they put him in it, and they just riddle the car with bullets. But they're saying that there's low interest when people like a mobster dies. Yeah. So if the, if the crime scene's weird enough, you know what I mean? Later testimony from DeMeo's son, Frederick the Gnome and Vito Arena, indicate that Roy expressed regret at having to kill Chris and at times appeared depressed over it. For the DeMeo crew, life must go on. As 1979 comes around, they begin to expand their auto theft operation. They are making moves that will make it the largest of its kind in New York City's history. The scheme involves five partners, put together by Roy, who conspire to steal hundreds of cars and ship them internationally from New Jersey to Kuwait. The five partners are reportedly raking in 30 grand, approximately 114 grand today per week. Of course, the actual stealing is done by crew members like Vito Arena, Denome, and the like. Incredibly, the entire operation is almost thwarted by a legitimate car dealer who threatens to expose the crime to law enforcement. Naturally, he is killed along with an uninvolved companion before he ever gets close to reporting the crime. Just when it seems like things are finally back on track, there is more trouble on the horizon. This time it comes in the form of two fellow Gambito family members named James Eppolito and James Eppolito Jr. These two are made guys, they're the relatives of a well-known corrupt NYPD detective, and they also have a brother that's a made guy in the Gambino family. So these two guys, when they come to Castellano, they're not without their clout. Disgruntled Eppolito boys meet with Paul Castellano and levy outrageous allegations of narcotics trafficking on the part of Gaggi and DeMeo. They remind their boss that the punishment for this infraction is death. Always the arbitrator of blind justice, Castellano weighs the evidence at hand and exonerates his friend Gaji. He further gives Gaji the nod to deal with these two crybabies however he sees fit. On October 1st, 1979, Gaji and DeMeo somehow manage to get themselves into Eppolito Jr.'s 1978 Ford Thunderbird and hitch a ride to the Gemini Club. At some point, Eppolito Sr. gets a funny feeling that this is no ordinary joyride, but it's too late. In the parked car, Gaji and DeMeo open fire on the snitches, cracking the windows just a bit beforehand to prevent from rupturing their eardrums from the sound of gun blasts. Murphy's Law kicks into high gear as a taxi car driven by an off-duty police officer hears the shots and gives chase to the monster. In the end, DeMeo evades capture. But Gaji is arrested after being shot in the neck. Roy is never identified by witnesses, but Anthony Gaji faces charges of murder and the attempted murder of the arresting officer. 
He ends up corrupting the jury and gets the lesser charge of assault, which lands him 5 to 15 years in federal prison. It turns out to be an exercise in futility, as DeMeo murders the sole witness shortly after Gaji's sentencing hearing in March of 1980. The massive Kuwaiti car theft operation, now dubbed the Empire Boulevard operation by law enforcement, expands through 1979 to 1980 until the warehouse that serves as the headquarters is raided by the FBI that following summer. The feds had seen the unloading of vehicles there and had obtained a search warrant. Henry Borelli and Frederick Denome are arrested in May 1981 for their roles in the operation, but there is not enough evidence to arrest any of the other active partners. Roy orders Borelli and Denome to plead guilty to the charges in hopes that it will stop any further investigations into his activities by the FBI or other law enforcement agencies. So that's wishful thinking. By now this is a huge international case and it seems everyone in law enforcement wants a piece of this pie. And uh, I really haven't told this story much by the uh, cop point of view. But all along, there is police that are looking into different parts of this. Like the car theft is out of control. So there's these guys, right? And then there's the murder guys. And they're starting to look at the homicides and stuff. So in the background, over the years that we're covering, these guys are getting together. They're starting to compare notes. And they're putting this all together. And like when this car thing happens, they're like, holy shit. They never even imagined that a car theft operation could be this sophisticated. And on the flip side... The homicide division is starting to realize they never imagined that it could be this sophisticated, but they're about to find out it's just the tip of the iceberg. A bigger problem is a couple of ex-gang members named Vito Arena and Joseph Lee. Vito and Joseph were stick-up guys by trade, but learned the art of car theft and the DeMeo gang. The problem with these two was that they were also a homosexual couple in a world that was less than culturally enlightened at the time. Open about their sexuality, the two became the targets of aggression in the DeMeo gang. Soon they were fearful that they'd be killed merely for sport, and they decided to return to their carefree days of armed robbery, free from the persecution of homophobic gangsters. So the problem with these two is that they get busted in a stick-up after they leave the gang, and Arena decides to talk about the DeMeo crew. He didn't even want much of a deal. All he wants to do is be locked up with his boyfriend. Like, he doesn't ask for, you know, money. He doesn't ask for any leniency, any immunity, right? So they're just like, well, hell yeah. And they go and they get this detective in. And it's like a Sunday night, right? So they're like, you got some dirt on the mail? He goes, yeah, they're, uh, you know, they're killing people over there. They're chopping them up. And they're like, what? He goes, yeah, we chop them up. And he starts telling them how this shit goes down, you know? Their jaws are hitting the floor. They had no idea. And he's like telling them like, yeah, you know, the head comes right off. It's no problem. And it's, I've seen pictures of this guy though. He's huge. Like think pussy bumping Sarah. So like, yeah. So when you're hearing about these guys, they're not some wispy little guys. You know, they're big dudes. And uh, he's, he's just giving it out. Right. And I actually found out that uh, Sopranos veto that whole scenario. Based on this. Based on this. Yeah. Yeah. Vito, uh, the guy who plays him, said, yeah, we decided to take this and kind of apply it to the storyline. Wow. Yeah. We just, yeah. And he's, it's, it's the same kind of deal because that guy was no pushover, you yeah, know? Yeah. So that's that's kind of where this is going. And uh, he tells him about this one guy in particular, Joseph Scorny. He's like, we killed him and we shoved him in a barrel, but he wouldn't fit in the barrel. So we had to take a shovel and we just popped his head off. And then we could put his head down in the barrel with him. We filled it with concrete and we dumped it off a boat. He's like, so we, we dumped him off into the water. So he shows them where it is. They get a scuba team out there with the cops and everything. And they say the scuba guy comes up in about 10 minutes. It was three years ago that they dumped this body, right? The scuba guy comes up and goes, eh, it's like 20 barrels down here. <laughs> So they're like, well, it's the one you can't move because it's full of concrete. So, <laughs> so they start shaking them and everything. And apparently it's not welded shut. They just use that snap ring kind of oh, thing yeah. is the impression I get because it leaked. And they said over time the salt water just dissipated the concrete anyway. So they pour this guy out. Of course, he's bones. Yeah. But they still got his dungaree jacket, his wallet, everything. It's oh. scorny. And so now the shit's hitting the fan. As 1982 unfolds, the FBI is finally realizing the incredible number of people that go into the Gemini Lounge and never come out. Paul Castellano is ready to cut his losses. He's put out a hit on Roy DeMeo, but is having a hard time finding someone to do the job. 
It's rumored that even John Gotti doesn't want the job, as DeMeo has an army of killers at his disposal. It's been speculated that the hit is eventually carried out by two of Roy's own men. I read somewhere that Gotti had actually said he'd only killed maybe 10 or 12 men at that time to DeMeo's hundreds. Yeah. In his last days, Roy is said to have been seen on the streets, heavily armed, and paranoid as hell. So I saw one of the docs that uh, featured a detective talking about this whole time period. And what they decide to do is to approach him. And uh, there's accounts where he's walking around all paranoid. I feel like he's coked up. You know, every description of him sounds like a coked up, jacked up guy. But he's got this big leather coat on. He's carrying a shotgun around. You know, he's looking all around and stuff. So the uh, cop goes and he uh, tells him that he knows what's going on. You know, and he's like, here's your chance. And the DeMeo immediately tries to bribe him. He's like, you're an old guy. Why do you want to mess with this stuff, man? Tell you what, how about I give you a million bucks, Swiss bank account, you forget this thing. All I need is the name of the informant. Who's telling you this shit? And the cop's basically like, you know what? I just as soon pull you out of the trunk of your car. But this is the chance to save your life. The man was like, nah, I'm a, I'm a soldier. And you remember, he wanted to do this his whole life. Yeah. And he's like, I'm a mob soldier and I'm going to die a mob soldier. If they're going to kill me, then it's my time. But he's not going to be a rat, you yeah. know, and he makes it very clear. Kind of honorable. Yeah. So anyway, it's uh, Albert DeMeo tells a lot about his uh, final days. And then he said he uh, oh, actually... DeMeo con- was his son? That's his son, yeah. yeah. And he said he considered faking his death and leaving the country, which probably wouldn't have been a bad idea. No. But instead he leaves the house one day and just never comes back. And uh, Albert says he found uh, his personal belongings like his watch, his wallet, his ring. He left all those in the study room. With a religious pamphlet that like indicated that he went to confession one last time. So when he left the house, he was going knowing, it seems like, that he was going to be killed. According to Anthony Casso's 2008 biography, Roy DeMeo is killed at Patrick Testa's East Flatbush home by Joseph Testa and Anthony Center. The Casso biography notes that DeMeo was seated, about to receive coffee, when Testa and Center opened fire. Anthony Gaggi was not present. A few days later, on January 18th, Roy DeMeo is found murdered in his abandoned car's trunk. He has been shot multiple times in the head and has a bullet wound in his hand, assumed by law enforcement as being from throwing his hand up to his face in a self-defense reflex when the shots were fired at him. Anthony Gaggi is suspected by law enforcement officials of being the one who personally killed DeMeo, although it is likely crew members Joseph Testa and Anthony Center were present as well. The cop who offered the informant the deal is the one that pulls him from the trunk. According to the legend, he uh, when they find the body, he's like, don't open the trunk. I want to be the one to pull him out because I told him I'd pull his ass out of the trunk. So that's uh, the typical 70s cop thing. You know, I want to live up to that. Yeah. So he, he's the one that pulls him out. Yeah, he was uh, frozen. It, it was The temperature had dropped. He'd been in there about four days. So he's actually in the car, shot up in a fetal position and he's frozen stuck to a chandelier that he was supposed to get repaired and now it's like frozen to his body and uh that's that's how they find him well what was wrong with the chandelier that's my question uh, probably a wiring issue <laughs> there's something wrong with it now there's a dead guy frozen to it <laughs> in april 1984 colombo crime family soldier ralph scopo is overheard explaining to an associate that DeMeo had been killed by his own family because they merely suspected that he wouldn't be able to stand up to legal charges that resulted from his stolen car ring. The motive, as suggested by Scopo, is widely accepted by law enforcement and other sources. Another reason was that DeMeo was attracting too much attention from the FBI. DeMeo's crew is soon rounded up and the core members, Henry Borelli, Joseph Testa, and Anthony Center, are imprisoned for life after two trials that see them convicted of a collective total of 25 murders in addition to extortion. Gaji is never charged with the crime, although he is charged with a number of other murders. He dies of a heart attack during his trial in 1988 at age 62. Paul Castellano was indicted for ordering the murder of DeMeo, as well as a host of other crimes, but is killed in December 1985 while out on bail in the middle of his first trial. The murder is ordered by John Gotti, who thus becomes the new boss of the Gambino family. This concludes the legend of Roy Albert DeMeo. 
See, I was talking to some guys on Instagram about this because I just posted a picture of DeMeo and said we were getting ready for it and stuff. And a guy had made the point, if they'd have kept him alive, if Castellano would have kept him alive, he could have probably insulated himself from his own assassination. You know, because uh, Gotti was unstoppable at this point. Yeah. But he's like, the mail crew would have stopped Gotti. Right. <laughs> yeah, they would have. Like, yeah. He's like, he, if he had just wrote it out, you know, this this would have been okay. And also, they're killing people left and right because they think he's going to turn informant. I see nothing in DeMeo that says he's going to rat. No. Nothing. Yeah, and this is a... Everybody's ratting at this point. Everybody they're picking up, all the car thieves, everybody is ratting, 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 ratting. But I just... You never know, but I think DeMeo is a different cat. You know, I always thought, too, like uh, in my personal life, I think people with kids and families are bad partners for this kind of stuff because you'll do anything. Right. You'll use your kids as a justification. You know what I mean? Like, oh, either I have to protect them or I owe them a better life. And yeah, you do, but that's why you don't get into this shit. You know what I mean? But I've seen people do some really messed up stuff because, well, I got to, if I didn't have my kid, yeah. you know, but sorry, I got to rat on all you yeah. because my kid needs a father, mm-hmm. you know? And uh, so just in my opinion, good family men make lousy criminals. Yeah. You know yeah. I mean? yeah. Cause, it's fair. Yeah. So anyway, just to remind everybody, there's a lot of speculation about how many people he killed. Like there's a, 10 minute interview online of uh, Michael Franchese kind of poo poo the whole numbers thing and he's like yeah you know I'll say I killed 200 people if I didn't because nothing's going to happen and if he did he probably wouldn't admit it and it's all bullshit and these numbers they throw out but uh, it seems like a lot I saw he killed 50 people then I saw he killed 75 people then I saw he killed 200 people another one said he killed a thousand people you know <laughs> the numbers could easily easily rack up and uh, maybe you're not talking DeMeo personally. I would say anybody killed by the DeMeo crew, the DeMeo crew yeah. counts. Like I said, at first I was kind of scoffing at the numbers myself. And then I just started doing some simple math. I'm like, this could easily, yeah, easily <laughs> add up quickly. The mathematician, Bill Crooks. <laughs> yeah. <I> mean, <laughs> so what did happen after this all shakes out? They get a warrant for the Gemini. And they go in and they take the drains out. Mm. And uh, there's blood in the drains. And they use that to identify a lot of the people. But there's so many missing people and everything. And when this whole comes out, what, what a horror show it was. Poor people are saying like, well, my daughter came up missing and she used to hang out there and stuff. And the police are just getting flooded with calls and they can't help. You know what I mean? They just don't have the, the resources to, to name everybody that's out. Well, it is a long night. I think we're going to take off. Hey, thanks for listening. Uh, if you've been with us the whole time, we really appreciate it. Uh, make sure you tell some people. All right, have a great night. Thank you for listening to Partners in Crime. This week's episode is an adaptation of several different historical accounts. Music is courtesy of Kevin McLeod. All sources and attribute links can be found in the show notes. If you enjoyed this episode, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Partners in Crime Podcast. Links are in the show notes. If you didn't like the show, keep your mouth shut. No one likes a rat.